a second Bit Curator Consortium Roundtable, Practice Values, Situating Digital Forensics Tools in Archives. I'm Hannah Wong, and I'm the Project Manager for the Bit Curator EU project at Educopia. I also serve on several committees with the BCC, and we are so excited to welcome our excellent and generous speakers, Snowden Becker, Monique Wasser, Yvonne Ng, and Keith Pendergrass, who are all engaged in exciting work around born digital documentation and preservation. So um, just to give a little background on this event, um, we started thinking about hosting this roundtable back in February before many of the recent events that have brought born digital documentation and the intersections between archives and law enforcement into stark relief. The topic for today's discussion was germinated in our own BCC community, where the focus has shifted from solely supporting and using BitCurator to generally furthering digital curation goals across the field and sustaining open source software tools to this end. Um, the events of the past few months and the accompanying calls for more deliberate and ethical approaches to collecting have only amplified the need to have conversations about these tools and also to situate them within our practices and values. We hope that the discussion today with our esteemed colleagues is a starting point for even more reflection on why and how we approach work using and supporting digital forensics tools. So the first hour or so of this roundtable will be a facilitated discussion with our four panelists, which I will be moderating. Following this discussion, there will be 30 minutes for audience Q&A. Um, a few housekeeping items before we dive into the discussion. Um, this event will be partially recorded through the first part of the discussion. We will stop recording for the second part of the discussion and the recording will remain off for the audience Q&A, um, generally with the hope that this will encourage more open discussion among the panelists and the participants. Um, this recording will be made public and distributed on August 11th. So all of the attendees are muted by default. Um, we encourage you to ask questions by typing them into the Q&A, which you can find in the bar at the bottom of the Zoom window. Jess Farrell, Brian Dietz, and Laura Alanya have kindly offered to monitor the Q&A. You have the option to ask a question anonymously or to have your name attached. All questions can be seen by all participants and um, some questions will be answered live by the speakers during the Q&A, while others may have typed answers in the Q&A window. Um, if you'd like to use the chat to send a message to all attendees, please make sure that you select the option to send to all panelists and attendees. So um, now I'll introduce our speakers. Snowden Becker is an audiovisual archives consultant, educator, and researcher who specializes in non-theatrical media, from home movies to police body cam footage. She is a former member of the video committee of the Scientific Working Group on Digital Evidence and has conducted field work and collaborative research related to law enforcement agencies' long-term management of audiovisual media alongside other forms of evidence. From 2012 to 2019, she managed the graduate programs in media archiving and library and information science at UCLA. She currently serves on the board of the Association of Moving Image Archivists and works with a wide range of personal and institutional collections as a member of the Myriad Consulting Group. Monique Wasser recently began as the first full-time digital archivist at Harvard University's Houghton Library. Her area of work and research focuses on issues in software preservation, born digital archives, and information maintenance. Prior to joining Harvard, Monique worked for the university libraries at the University of Arizona, where she oversaw development of the library's digital preservation strategy and program, and a digital preservation startup company, Digital Bedrock, researching file formats and software obsolescence. Monique earned her MSLIS and BA in English Literature from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Yvonne Ng is the Archives Program Manager at Witness, where she trains and supports partners on collecting, managing, and preserving video documentation for human rights advocacy and evidence. She also develops training resources related to archiving and preservation, such as the groundbreaking Activist Guide to Archiving video. 
Yvonne holds an MA in Moving Image Archiving and Preservation from NYU, where she has also taught a course on personal digital archiving and a BA in Cinema Studies from the University of Toronto. Yvonne formerly served on the Board of Directors for the Association of Moving Image Archivists and on the Advisory Board of Documenting the Now, and is currently an advisor for the Memory Lab Network and Open Archive. Keith Pendergrass is the digital archivist for Baker Library Special Collections at Harvard Business School, where he develops and oversees workflows for born digital materials. His research and general interests include integration of sustainability principles into digital archive standard practice, systems thinking, energy efficiency, and clean energy and transportation. He holds an MSLIS from Simmons College and a BA from Amherst College. So thank you once again to our panelists for joining us for this discussion today. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and start my video. Just a little bit of Zoom maintenance. Um, okay, so we'll go ahead and get started. So the first question, um, I'd like to give each of the panelists a chance to answer just to kind of contextualize our conversation. Um, so that question is, what is your professional relationship to digital forensics tools? How do you understand forensics in the context of your work? Um, and I'll start with Snowden. This is where I remember to unmute myself before speaking. Um, my, um, my experience with digital forensics tools has mainly been um, from the law enforcement side. Um, my interest in, um, in non-theatrical media actually led me to law enforcement because some of the most famous home movies in the world are evidence of crimes in progress. I'm thinking of things like the Rodney King arrest video shot by George Holliday. Um, the, um, the, the Zapruder film of the Kennedy assassination, um, George Tatsuno's footage of the Topaz concentration camp, which is the only massive civil rights violation our country has ever uh, formally apologized for and made reparations for. Um, oh, it looks like maybe we lost audio. Can everybody hear me okay now? A little thumbs up, does sound better? Okay. Um, I got interested in how law enforcement agencies were managing audiovisual material alongside other forms of evidence because that's such a high stakes process and, um, and started working with um, a local law enforcement agency in Texas and um, did about nine months of participant observation in their major crimes unit, um, which meant that I kind of saw the, the processing of um, audiovisual evidence from things like patrol car video, from um, from um, victim cell phones, from all kinds of different sources, um, and legacy material um, where um, they were moving forward from one platform to another, or working with um, working with material from a variety of sources over which they had no control. So I'm I'm interested in um, the use of digital forensics tools as a sort of social informatics uh, from a social informatics perspective. What gets them adopted is often um, decisions made by higher ups within an organization that know very little about the needs and requ technical requirements of uh, the people actually using the tools. Or um, I've talked to law enforcement agencies that are already in um, a vendor ecosystem for one um, kind of tool. And so they feel committed to um, staying with that vendor ecosystem um, for other technology needs, even though they know those tools aren't sufficient. Um, so one of the one of the things I'm most interested in is how um, how and whether we can collaborate as communities on developing better tools that are open source, transparent, um, more reliable, and more trustworthy um, for the the kinds of um, projects that we have in common, namely um, guaranteeing the authenticity, integrity, and reliability of digital records that are stored for the long term. Thank you, Snowden. Um, next, can we go to Monique? Sure. Hi. Um, so my professional relationship to digital forensics tools really is from kind of like an archival perspective, uh, working within special collections um, and kind of stewarding the materials that they collect. Um, at Arizona, I was situated outside of special collections, so 
um, digital forensics um, was mainly, you know, a way to ensure that we're retaining authenticity and then also, you know, enabling a greater degree of control when we're capturing the object um, in terms of uh, preservation. And so I mainly work with, you know, researchers on um, files like at Arizona um, at, with at-risk media using digital forensics to help us work with at-risk media. Um, but also for some uh, cases, making sure that we, you know, have a complete object that we can render in um, a way that allows a greater control for access. Um, so, you know, working with the Fostering Communities of Practice grant project, uh, digital forensics was really um, you know, a workflow that we used to ensure that we were preserving the games um, as a part of our grant project. Um, and now at Houghton, it's, you know, somewhat similar. I think, you know, right now I'm working with literary papers and authors, um, but digital forensics is really um, a way it's still to work with at-risk media um, and just allow um, for emulation later on down the line. Um, with also, it's also been a concern with um, kind of sensitive data um, and being able to at least identify that um, and either redact it later on or find a way to, um, to you know, retain the disk image without um, compromising the authenticity. Um, so it's mainly been from a practitioner kind of archival social collections perspective. Thanks, Monique. Next, um, can we hear from Yvonne? Yeah, can you hear me? Um, thank you so much for having me here. Um, so I guess from where I'm situated, which is sort of in the human rights documentation world, human rights videos specifically, um, I kind of, I, I understand forensics broadly to refer to any of like the methods and tools involved in collecting, analyzing, um, authenticating, and verifying um, the evidence or media um, for investigative purposes for human rights investigations. Um, so it could refer to, um, you know, finding and collecting video evidence of a human rights crime um, that's been shot by an ordinary citizen who witnessed um, the violation, um, perhaps even by a perpetrator, um, or perhaps like a, an advocate or somebody who was um, an observer. Um, of, of the incident. Um, it would include like tools and methods for collecting that evidence in a way that protects its integrity, its chain of custody, um, and its metadata so that it could be used in advocacy and evidence later on. Um, it would include um, um, tools to analyze that media and to like verify its authenticity so that, you know, people could say that it, it the video is uh, showing what it claims to show, and it's from the time and place that it claims to be from. Um, and then processing it so that it can be preserved to be used um, as evidence, you know, tomorrow, the next day, or, or years down the line. Um, you know, I think, um, you know, these concerns with authenticity and verification have been um, issues with, you know, uh, or questions for human rights documentation, you know, uh, forever. But I think forensics now is coming more um, to, the, to the fore um, as courts and other human rights mechanisms are relying more on, um, you know, video that was shot on somebody's cell phone that may have been shared or reshared over and over again on social media. Um, and with the emergence of, you know, these new forms of synthetic media that, you know, we call deep fakes um, and those sort of circulating more and more as well. Thank you, Yvonne. And last but certainly not least, Keith. Yeah, so my relationship has been very similar as uh, Monique's, that it's been completely within a special collections department with records management environment as well. Um, and we use the digital forensics tools for capturing and processing digital materials in a way that enables us to maintain the authenticity and integrity. Um, so we use primarily FTK Imager as well as FC5025 and Cryoflux for the capture of digital materials from storage media where we have control of them. Um, and then we use the full forensic toolkit to conduct our archival prox processing. And kind of when we were first starting out, we had always said that we are doing digital forensics and this became kind of the buzzword. Um, and administrators latched onto this as a way to show 
how our department was either being innovative or was part of this growing community of practice. But over the past few years, we've been trying to move away from this because we really aren't doing digital forensics. We aren't conducting investigations of our donors. Um, so we now say that we're using digital forensics tools and techniques in our work as part of the way that we ensure that authentic authenticity and integrity of our digital materials. Um, so the, the context of it is really acknowledging where these tools and techniques come from, but then explaining to our staff, to our administrators, to our donors, how we're using those tools and techniques in a specific way for our cultural heritage purposes. Thank you, Keith. I think that's a really great point to bring up about the terminology and how it helps to contextualize the work or it may kind of obfuscate or kind of confuse the work that's actually being done. Um, so thank you for bringing that up. That kind of gets to the next question. So how and by whom were you trained to use these tools? And was there a discussion of the social context of the creation and usage of digital forensics tools? Um, and if we could start with Keith and Monique, since you come from kind of a more archival processing background with these tools, so that'd be great. Yeah. Um, so I had some very initial training by other staff in my repository, um, and then also a one-time two-day training by Digital Intelligence, where they came to Harvard several years ago and gave us uh, FRED and FTK training for everybody at Harvard that was using those particular tools. Um, and other than that, it's pretty much just been experience, trial and error, going through the user manual. And there really wasn't much social discussion or discussion of the social context at all. It was more in a way of just introducing what the tools were that they were developed for law enforcement investigations. Um, and the point of that was more that they were trying to, um, the trainers were trying to show why this was important for the work that we do. And it was all about not altering the materials while they're in use in the tool. Um, but there wasn't any further discussion about the social context. Um, so I think I'm a little unique in the sense that I had training when I went to school. I graduated in 2017 from my master's in um, LIS. But um, there was a course on digital preservation, um, and Rhiannon Bativia was the one teaching it, and we used Baycreator in the course. So um, that's kind of where the digital forensic was introduced to me. And we did have, you know, there were conversations about the social context of, you know, these tools, why we're using them, the implications of that. Um, but training otherwise, I think, was largely like on the job. Um, I was an intern for the um, I can't remember the exact name, but it's SAA, I think Digital Forensics Working Group, um, something like that. Um, I was an intern for them, and so I did get a different kind of perspective, like of what it would entail um, to actually work with these tools, like what considerations, like very kind of nitty gritty. Um, and I, they did come, um, excuse me, it's the Digital Archives Subspecial or Specialist Subcommittee. Um, they offered trainings and I brought them to University of Arizona. Um, so there was that as well. Um, and that was kind of an overview of all the tools that we're generally familiar with, you know, FDK, BitCreator, um, those are the two big ones. Um, and talking about some open source ones as well. Um, other than that, largely on the job um, and, you know, uh, online based. Noted, or, uh, or Yvonne, do you have anything to respond to or any thoughts about how you kind of have learned about these tools? Um, I, I One of the activities that the Scientific Working Group on Digital Evidence um, engages in is best practices. Um, and there is a ton of concern in writing best practices for um, law enforcement and for, for forensic collection of digital evidence um, in, in, in what the legal context is and the establishment of best practices as a legal requirement. Um, so it's in, specifically in um, the context of if we develop processes and procedures at, or make recommendations for um, working methods or workflows for collection or securing of audiovisual evidence, um, what are the consequences of us saying, you know, this should be done or this must be done? Um, what standard is that going to mean that people who are responsible for forensic um, securement of evidence are going to be held responsible 
for. Um, so there is an awareness within um, the, the uh, law enforcement community and the community that is looking at and collecting evidence for legal and procedural purposes um, that, there's, that there's a context in which those processes might be um, scrutinized and, um, and, and made, um, made to have consequences. Um, but the the larger sort of ethical community standards um, or the potential of those processes to affect long term preservation or um, authenticity and integrity of record keeping um, is is not really present. Um, being the only archivist in the room in those discussions was often really interesting. Yeah, and I think any familiarity um, I have with digital forensic tools or or methods um, have, has come pretty like it, you know informally and with experience as as the other um, panelists have mentioned you know like through you know knowledge sharing networks and workshops you know I it's a it, it, it's still like a, I think a developing uh, methodology in the in the human rights world like a lot of there's a lot of interesting work happening in the what's called the open source investigations community um, so people who are like collecting and verifying um, media that's being shared on social media. Um, yeah, and I think there's just like a lot of like learn, learning while doing. Um, as, as Snowden mentioned, like, you know, a lot of these methodologies have been, or, and tools have been developed, um, you know, for other purposes, like specifically for law enforcement. Um, you know, some, there are some tools that are being developed, you know, specifically for human rights documentation purposes by the human rights community and with overlapping communities like the open source investigations and, you know, journalists, you know, digital, digital security um, folks. Um, but I think, you know, definitely a lot of it comes in with law enforcement. And, and there is a lot of discussion, I think, about the social context in which these tools are being developed um, and used. And I think, you know, an important thing for us to remember is, you know, just like archives aren't neutral, like digital forensics is not neutral either. Um, it, uh, you know, this approach, this forensics approach definitely privileges certain um, ways of thinking and ways of knowing and um, certain types of information and value certain types of information. Um, so one thing I wanted to, just to throw out there is, you know, what's interesting, I think, is that with, you know, forensics tools and methodologies are like most useful in a context where there is an absence of trust and an absence of memory um, in, in a given community. Um, you know, whether because it just doesn't exist yet or it's actually been actively eroded or whether or perhaps because it's in a context where it's just lo logistically, you know, unfeasible to have trust, like let's say because of scale of the community or something. Um, but, you know, what, what forensics enables is that like you don't actually have to trust me when I say that something is authentic. You can just look at this object to, to determine that. Um, and uh, I don't know, I guess it's just thinking about like, you know, we're seeing an increased reliance on these kinds of tools. So what does that say about the, the current state of our human condition or the state of the world that we're, that we're living in? Thanks, Yvonne. I think that is a really interesting point about the, um, yeah, kind of the condition of an absence of trust to, in order to like, um, need to prove authenticity. I, I was wondering if any of the panelists have anything that they'd like to respond to with that. I mean, yeah, I feel like that is one of the really nice benefits of taking a forensic approach, even if you don't take that approach all the way through to your longer term preservation or your access, that when you use that approach for your capture and your processing, you have this very nicely documented chain of custody. And it's using tools that have been thoroughly vetted um, that we don't need to try to prove that Forensic Toolkit is doing what it says, um, that we can in some ways just trust that tool, um, do the work that we need to do, focus our efforts in on that work, um, and then know that our outputs are going to be um, essentially documented in a certain way that we can prove that integrity and that authenticity from capture through to deposit into a preservation repository. 
So this kind of ties into another one of the questions, um, which is, in what cases do you take a forensic intervention with your data and when do you not um, for you know a various number of reasons could be overkill or could just be you know not appropriate for different reasons um, and what are your ethical considerations when you're deciding whether or not to take these interventions and anyone can answer that one unless you want me to pick on you I can go. Um, so it's mainly been around at-risk media. Um, so like any data that if we did not use kind of a forensic um, tool or technique, uh, we would you know, at great risk um, or there would be a high capability that we would not get the full amount of data that we need to render the object in a complete way. Um, so that's been like a main driving um, force for using forensic interventions um, and also kind of like around personal identifiable uh, information and sensitive data, um, using some of those um, tools to identify that data so that we can get rid of it. Um, I would say also, I mean, capturing disk images, I guess, like we can consider that a forensic intervention. I think like in general, the um, kind of the, our community does um, and that's mainly when I talk about like at risk media, um, using that as a method, I've been really wary to, to use it for every single, for use it as a catch all for all the data that I work with, because there are some collections, there are some materials that really don't need, um, to be captured that way. And I've been wary of that because what I've seen in the institutions that I work at, um, though I've only been at Harvard for a couple of months and I have well, worked remotely, so it's a little different. Um, but using the disk image is kind of like this, um, like a safety net. So we don't, we don't have the time or the resources to process these digital materials. So we're going to capture you know, the media data with a disk image and put it on storage and then we'll deal with it later. Um, and I've been really uncomfortable with that just because it's, as we've seen, the backlog does not kind of go away. And that's the workflow. Um, so I've been trying to be, I've been, I've tried to be a little more intentional with that forensic intervention, capturing disk images um, when there's really a reason to and we need to. Otherwise, um, I think we get ourselves into maybe over architecting the workflow for all of the digital materials we work with. And we have um, I mean, a pretty similar approach. So for capturing, for small capacity media, we create a forensic image by default, uh, but we've moved to essentially first conducting a little bit of appraisal on larger capacity media to be able to get a sense of the percentage of valuable materials that are stored on that media. And when the percentage is low, we often then use a tool like Bagit to just package the files that we want. Um, and in these types of cases, our considerations are really looking to environmental sustainability that we have very few use cases that require preservation of a forensic image. So we've moved away from that as the default capture method for these larger um, media items as just another way that we can reduce the impact both of our storage infrastructure and of our digital object maintenance through our workflows. And then for processing, so we use regular expression and keyword searches to find sensitive information such as PII, as well as some of the built-in functionality of Forensic Toolkit to find emails or other files that maybe aren't in locations that we would expect on the images. And then we also sometimes recover deleted files, but our standing policy is not to do so unless we've been able to consult with the donor on those materials. Um, and for the processing side, our consideration here is almost always to try to align with both the donor's wishes and to protect third party privacy. Um, and a lot of this is because nearly all of the materials that we acquire at Baker Library Special Collections are professional in nature. So they are corporate records, they're professional papers of faculty members or other business leaders, or their administrative um, personnel, student records in our records management program. And in these cases, whether it's through a deed of gift for donated materials or the record schedule for our records management, the scope of the donation or transfer is really clear and it 
nearly always excludes personal materials. So we're actually using these forensic tools as a way to try to find the sensitive information so that we can then exclude it from our preservation file set. Um, I can go. Um, so, you know, I mentioned before that, you know, increasingly human rights evidence is being you know, created by, you know, bystanders, witnesses, like this recording on their phones. And, you know, it, it's, it can be very um, difficult to determine the origin and the source of, and to verify the source of those videos. You know, I was talking actually to somebody, you know, last week um, who uh, 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 it was talking about how they gather um, evidence for their human rights reports and that the bulk of the, the videos that he's collecting is, co is coming through um, his colleagues, uh, WhatsApp, like friends and family WhatsApp groups, right? And, uh, you know, when, and when something is shared on WhatsApp, it's very difficult to find it where it comes from because there's no metadata because the videos are like highly compressed. If they get shared around and forwarded, it's hard to know what, what the original, where the original was. Um, so, you know, it's the, I think the intervention that, um, you know, my organization a witness makes is to um, provide training and guidance for people who are doing the documentation um, to sort of make their documentation easier for people who are using forensics tools like later down the line to make it easier for those people to authenticate and verify those videos. So like really basic so not so much like training them on using tools, but more like on, on method, methods and practices, like how to film, um, film, film your videos in such a way that the location is really easy to identify, or, you know, um, filming the time and date on your phone, like pointing your camera down onto, onto a phone so that the time and date is there. So it's easier for somebody to sort of trace that video back to its origins. Yeah, thank, that, um, that's a really interesting kind of uh, reframing of some of the discussion, but I, I think that it's interesting that a lot of different ethical considerations came up. There was, you know, doing less work on the front end, but creating technical debt potentially down the line with disk images. There's environmental concerns. There's privacy concerns with the donors, but then also, um, you know, making sure that people are capturing documentation in a way that is you know, where information can be captured in the future by tools and people who are, you know, processing or um, doing any kind of verification. So um, this next question kind of ties into um, what Yvonne was just talking about, talking, talking to records creators. Um, how do you talk to donors or records creators about what could be revealed within their donated materials, um, either to archivists or other people during the processing phase or researchers during access? I would say, I'm just gonna jump in here and say, I would say that this is no different from any other kind of collection um, circumstance that um, often uh, people are believe that they are more familiar with the content of their collection than not um, than, than they actually are um, they forget things are there I think anybody who's ever processed a paper materials collection and found like old t-shirts or dirty socks um, knows what I'm talking about um, the 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 problem is or the the challenge is to have procedures in place to um, anticipate that and to um, to make sure that you are um, able to reach back out to the donor or depositor and say you know here we've discovered this um, often that means acknowledging that you know things that they might perhaps wish that you didn't or um, dealing with some you know some some discomfort or awkwardness um, and I think tra transparency, um, clear response, and and having procedures in place to begin with to say this is this is our process when this happens, um, and whether that's discovering um, 
uh, explicit material in a home movie collection or um, uh, PII in a, a corporate collection that, you know, that, that the donor did not realize was in there um, or sensitive, you know, sensitive documents. Um, the having, having some sort of, um, some sort of uh, reaction policy in place is a really, really good idea. Um, and being able to judge on a case by case basis what the appropriate action is. Um, I think that for for digital materials, um, the, there are a lot of parallels with um, with paper based and and sort of analog materials. I think that the ethical standards already in place in the community cover those circumstances pretty well. Um, but but being prepared for them, realizing that um, that the technology change isn't going to make the um, the human nature of these records any different. Yeah, just to build on what um, Snowden was um, saying, you know, in, in the human rights world, you know, one of the key principles is like informed consent, right? But, you know, in, in a situation where you're performing these kind of digital forensics processes on, on, on these materials and, and uncovering things that people might not have realized were in their, in their own collections, like what, like how do you, what does informed consent like is the is the consent any consent that was given truly informed if that's if that's the case um and i think monique earlier you met you talked about like uh, you know educating um donors on like what digital like what a digital forensics tool are doing and, and what kind of information could be uncovered um i think that's really um important like the transparency note in that you mentioned um I, you know, a, slight, a slightly different context, but like a question that we get a lot from activists is uh, is about metadata. Like everybody has heard this term metadata, but it's like it's not really clear to people like what metadata is actually included in their in their videos. So like on one hand, some people have an over like think that there's a lot more metadata than there actually is, and that you can glean a lot more than you actually can. But um, you know, in some cases, like people might not realize, for instance, that a documentation app they're using like includes their IP address when they upload the video. And that's like really important um, to know because it reveals like where you were when you uploaded the, the video. Um, I think there's also, you know, a lot of um, misconceptions that can impact like um, the work of verification or authentication, like people might not understand where, like they, they see the metadata of a video, but they might not actually understand how that metadata was generated or where, like where it comes from, like how, where the phone is pulling that data from, which can lead to like misinterpretation of the meaning of, of that of that data. Um, I in my work, you know, I almost never talk to the donor. Um, it's usually like mediated through the curator or someone else, a collections archivist. Um, and so it's usually been like, you know, it, we've talked a little bit about this, you've mentioned Snowden and Yvonne, uh, like having documentation for the, um, for the curators, whoever's going to have the conversation with the donor in place. Um, there's a questionnaire usually like going through kind of um, the different sort of scenarios, um, like for what kind of data could be in the collection, but also, at my last institution, we had like a very basic clause in the deed of gift mentioning that we use forensic techniques and tools. And so like we might run into X, Y, Z. We're not going to use that data. Um, we're going to like get rid of it or maybe something a little bit less uh, prescriptive. But I mean, I think it is a good exercise to kind of right size like what you're willing to do, what you can do with what you're going to you know, communicate to your donors because it forces you to be transparent and also to take a look at maybe your workflow and like what you're able to do with that data. Um, but that's, yeah. I would say it's also really important to know what your legal obligations are, um, that there are off the possibility of finding material that is um, illegal, harmful, um, or has legal implications and being in the possession of that material um, can have implications for your institution or for you personally. Um, so knowing, knowing what you are mandated to report um, or, or that you, what you might be in a position of, of being mandated to report, especially if you're working with um, uh, collections from sensitive communities or um, or human rights material, the 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 uh, the requirements to protect yourself and your institution um, and your donors and depositors are um, compelling, but sometimes competing. 
just want to add really quickly to that. I think that's a really good point because um, I feel like often we are not in compliance with our local IT security requirements with what we're putting on storage. Um, but something I forgot earlier was something that does concern me is kind of web archiving, um, kind of the conversations that we've had about kind of human rights, um, uh, digital objects. I find that, you know, in the institutions that I've worked at, there tends to be kind of um, like, we're just going to take it and not really notify anyone. And I think it may be low stakes, but at the same time, it does worry me sometimes. Um, it seems to that people are often like more okay with taking a kind of a blase approach with just archiving whatever they want on the web. On the web. Um, and I wonder, you know, if later on we decided to apply some digital forensics techniques and tools to this data, like, you know, what would we do then, what the implications are. Um, so I think that's a, just a question I have, I guess, when I'm doing my work. Yeah, and our approach has been um, kind of similar to what Monique was saying, where it's been mediated through curators. Um, and it's been really about making sure that we discuss our techniques with the donor um, about how they can capture everything on the media deleted files, partially overwritten files. Um, but it's more focused on ensuring that the donors trust our process and trust our internal staff because we don't deliver any full images to researchers, only files extracted from those images. Um, so it's our efforts have really been showing prospective donors by our actions on previous donors materials, previous collections, that they can trust our appraisal and processing workflows, that they can trust us to capture this material and then identify any potentially sensitive content and working with the donor and based on our policies, either deaccession it or restrict it. Um, that said, we are very clear with our donors that we're going to be doing this to the best of our ability and from an archival perspective. And that if somebody comes in to use this material who's seeking very specific information about the donor or the donor's actions, that person may find information in the collection that the donor considers sensitive that we didn't screen out. Um, so we always have um, some language in our deed that says we're gonna do this to the best of our ability. We're going to follow the current practices of our profession but we don't commit to finding absolutely everything that may be sensitive in your materials. Yeah, um, I think that there, yeah, there were just some really interesting points made about um, kind of the great care that should be taken with donors in terms of informing them of, you know, different kinds of risks and different things to look out for when they're, you know, creating or donating materials. Um, but I think it is a really interesting and kind of um, parallel point that Monique made about, you know, we don't necessarily take this care when we're web archiving. And there are, you know, I think Dr. Mingo now has done a lot of great work in this area kind of to um, take all of this, you know, all of these great principles that we have when we're dealing with like, a, you know, storage media when we, you know, collect it from a donor, but applying that to the web. Um, does anybody else have anything to add to that conversation? Sure, yeah. I mean, you know, just given everything that's going on in the United States um, these days, there's been, I've seen dozens of um, kind of these um, ad hoc archiving projects springing up or public, public curation projects maybe, I and mean, they're not necessarily involved in preservation, but, um, you know, it does definitely raises a lot of um, concerns around like, um, you know, con like consent, you know, just because somebody posts something on Twitter doesn't mean that they want it collected and preserved for all time, right? Um, and, you know, this is, as you mentioned, this is something that, you know, documenting the now has done a lot of work on. Um, but, you know, in the, in the context of, of like protests um, around police violence, I mean, you know, we, we try to encourage people if they're going to document to not document the protesters, but to document the actions of law enforcement, um, you know, just to um, protect the privacy and the security of people who might be participating in the protests, you know, especially these public projects, you don't, you don't know who's going to be accessing this, this media, right? Like, you don't know how it could be used against people. And we know that, you know, law enforcement, the FBI is asking people for these videos, for this documentation, so that they can identify people and, and you know, take actions against them. So um, yeah, it's definitely um, 
a huge concern.